Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional providing practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hello, I'm Justin Daniels. I am a shareholder and corporate M&A and tech transaction lawyer at the law firm Baker Donaldson, advising companies in the deployment and scaling of technology. Since data is critical to every transaction, I help clients make informed business decisions while managing data privacy and cybersecurity risk. And when needed, I lead the cyber legal data Breach Response Brigade. That was a lot of words. Yeah, I'm, I messed it up. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, e-commerce, professional services, and digital media. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more and to check out our best-selling book, Data Reimagined, Building Trust One Bite at a Time, visit redcloveradvisors.com. Well, today is going to be fun. Indeed. It's a little cold today, though. Nah, it's not. Might be. Really? It's because you're a weenie. It's cold in like most of the country when this is recording, but Okay. We'll get back to privacy. So today we have Ben Brook, who is the CEO and co-founder of Transcend. Backed by Excel and Index Ventures, Transcend helps the world's largest companies better given govern their data, simplifying compliance, unlocking strategic growth, and improving business resilience. Prior to co-founding Transcend, Ben studied computer science, astrophysics, and neuroscience at Harvard University. Originally from Toronto, Canada, he is a passionate and award-winning filmmaker. And in his spare time, Ben works on open source projects, studies guitar and piano, and plays a sport that Justin really likes, rugby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. That's I'm right. I read old. that on you like that. <laughs> I'm too old to play anymore. I played in college, <laughs> but craziest bunch of people you'll ever meet. But great bunch of folks. That's right. Super fun. Thank well, welcome to the show. And uh, it appears for anyone listening, our dog Basil might want to join our party too. So okay. he, he might have some questions for you then. All right, Basil, relax. We're all good. Uh, so Ben, as we like to ask all of our guests, how has your career evolved to this point in time? Yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be on the podcast. Um, so Uh, My career, uh, I've actually came straight into privacy out of college. Uh, We actually started working uh, in privacy and on privacy problems um, as co-founders throughout college. Um, So I met my co-founder, Mike Farrell, uh, you know, in my freshman dorm room. Uh, We were fast friends and kind of like, uh, we both sort of stay up chatting late about like, AI and uh, and data problems, and we we're just like really excited about that space. Um, and we would get together outside of school uh, and just like work on sort of statistics, data science projects together, um, and kind of just do like little hackathons together. Um, and we came across this uh, idea to like study our own beh- behavioral data and sort of figure out how uh, how you know our sleep might correlate correlate with our productivity during the day and you know actually sort of mine for insights out of our behavioral data. And so the way we actually got into privacy initially was um we basically went out and asked all of the tech companies and the apps on our phones for a copy of this behavioral data and uh th- this was you know around 2014 2015 and of course there were no laws or rights around uh you know us as uh American students having access to this information. And so basically, we just kind of ran into this brick wall. And every company was like, you know, that's our data, we can't share that with you. Um, Like, go away, right. And um, that really didn't make sense to us that there was like, just no avenue for us to have 
um, any way of actually receiving a copy of our own data. Um, and over time, we kind of really started believing that like there ought to be some basic rights around people uh, around people and their personal data. They should have some degree of control. They should be able to at least see what data exists. Um, perhaps they should even be able, be able to delete it. And sure enough, GDPR started brewing in Europe around that time. And that is when, um, you know, we started really uh, getting excited about the space and ultimately decided um, to kind of go back to those companies and ask them like what it would take for them to ship this feature of like, you can download your data, you can delete your data. Um, and um, ultimately they all sort of came back and said like, this is basically impossible. We've been collecting data for like two decades, uh, pouring it into like hundreds of data systems. And like actually giving you access to your data is like uh, ludicrous. Um, and so that was the attitude at the time, like 2016, 2017. Um, and um, you may remember kind of like GDPR kind of like blindsided most of the industry. And like it was kind of in the six month run up to like May 2018, where everybody started running around with their hair on fire. Um, and so around that time is when we uh, we were kind of looking into this space and getting like uh, we actually graduated right around then in 2017 um, and ultimately um, decided we would um, basically not take our job offers and like try to try to start like building uh, a company in privacy. Um, and so we've been uh, we've ultimately run Transcend for uh, just over six years. And um, in the beginning, we were very much focused on that like core problem of like, how do we give people access to their data? We looked at building a consumer first application, um, but ultimately concluded that the problem was in the business and that they had no infrastructure that could connect to personal data um, and actually, you know, tap it out of all of the systems that have been collecting it. Um, so uh, I guess my whole career in, in a sense has been in privacy and with Transcend. Um, and, um, and it's really sort of started from that crux of just like deeply believing in data rights. And since then we've expanded to become a comprehensive privacy platform. Um, but that was our sort of first kernel was like automating DSRs for, uh, for our business customers and helping them give their users actual meaning control of their data. Let's dive further into Transcend and how yeah. you're helping companies manage privacy. So can you share more about where Transcend is today and how it works? Certainly, yeah. Um, so Transcend is very much built on the first principle that all privacy challenges stem from the complexities of corporate data. Um, so we really believe that privacy only works when it's encoded directly into the systems that are handling personal data. Um, so really, uh, this means that, like, if you actually, like, on the ground, I'm sure you're familiar with this, Jody, is, like, uh, one of the biggest things that is that makes privacy difficult is, like, oftentimes it's kind of legal persona uh, trying to deal with the, like, mass of corporate data within the business. And oftentimes that means sort of begging engineering for resources, um, kind of like chasing down people across the organization who are data owners. Um, and it's a very just like complex problem because the data in the organization is extremely complex. Um, and so uh, ultimately what Transcend does is we connect to all of those data systems. We, are, uh, we have a massive integration catalog, which connects directly to every database in the company, every software tool in the company. Um, really any sort of logical data store and is able to uh, connect to understand the personal data in inside that system, delete it, export it, set a policy on it, and make sure that, for example, that person's data isn't used for certain use cases. Um, and so uh, on top of that sort of bedrock of connectivity into corporate data, um, we've built a full comprehensive privacy platform, which has products like DSR automation, consent management, uh, data discovery, data inventory, um, impact assessments, um, and so on. And so it's a it's a comprehensive platform. Um, and most of our customers will 
usually start with a few uh, components of that platform and then over time grow with us as uh, Transcend is like becomes their really sort of si single one-stop shop for their whole privacy program. Well, thank you for sharing. I think that does make a lot of sense as well with starting with a few and growing. I have found when companies say, well, I'm just going to go get, you know, six different modules, you they can't implement six all at the same time. They end up needing to start with the few and then they grow and expand as they're ready to do yeah. so, which makes it a more successful implementation and program build. Definitely. And 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 a lot of um a lot of our customers are not starting from zero either. Um, and so they may have, um, you know, a, a lot of our customers had GDPR apply to them in 2018. And so, um, again, sort of thinking back to like that six month, like frantic period leading up to GDPR, we saw a lot of just like Band-Aid solutions go into place where it's like, let's do something super manually. Let's like, you know, update our policy. Let's maybe put up hurdles in front of like the DSR submission. Um, let's, uh, and, and ultimately let's like, task all of our data owners in the organization with like almost constant operational work like let's have them fill out questionnaires you know on a regular cadence let's interview them ask them what kinds of data they they have and what kinds of data they're using um and ultimately like uh there's a, just a lot of like sort of v0 privacy programs out there and a lot of what our customers are doing are looking to sort of like it evolve past that band-aid fix like it's sort of like hit its expiry date and um and they're looking for something that is a long-term stable solution where they can really put a lot of this stuff onto autopilot and uh so a lot of what we see is like customers will take kind of the p0 problem and start with transcend there and then over time uh like automate more and more of their privacy program um, so, so a lot of the time there's like certain parts of their program, which it's okay to let it kind of like be on the band aid for one more year, maybe. And like, maybe it's the consent, uh, solution that they need to like really get nailed this year. And then, you know, next year, maybe it's going to be data mapping or something like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting motion. Um, but ultimately we're, we're typically helping our customers kind of evolve off of this sort of like first, uh, or Band-Aid fix. Band-Aid fixes are important. So there are a lot of pieces to a privacy program and privacy space is software market is pretty crowded. So what should, what software should companies start with? And what are the top three criteria companies should be considering when they evaluate different vendors? Sure. Um, so the, in terms of, so, so if you are starting from zero, um, typically we will see folks um, start with <clears throat> something like the data inventory. Um, so just getting basic understanding of like, what systems do we have in our business? How are we using data? Um, and ultimately producing something that can, uh, you know, turn into a ROPA eventually. Um, that will be often kind of step one because a lot of the kind of more governance focused uh, products like things like DSR automation or consent management, a lot of the decision making that comes in uh, with those projects uh, is a lot easier if you have an inventory of your data and you're aware of uh, the different systems. So for example, if you need to delete data from all the systems in your business, um, which contain personal data, it's usually helpful to know which systems contain personal data in the first place. And so the data inventory is a, is a great place to start um, for most um, sort of net new, like starting from scratch programs. Uh, but again, increasingly we're seeing that um, more and more businesses are past the sort of first stage of like forming a, an early privacy program. Um, and are now looking more toward like how do we how do we take this into a like long term steady state and where do we where can we find automation um, where can we sort of like take some of the process off of data owners and um, and replace that with uh, with software um, and so that part will all, always depend um, where 
companies should start. Uh, you know, in the past year or two, a lot of it has been focused on um, things like uh, new requirements from new laws, like uh, CPRA, for example, with uh, sort of the the expansion of do not sell um, to include now do not sell or share, which is kind of like an affirmation that that includes like cross contextual behavioral advertisers. Um, that has driven a lot of um, a lot of projects around overhauling consent management infrastructure, um, where you know cookie banners can only go so far to solve that problem. Um, in a lot of businesses, for example, data is being sent to advertisers through um, through data that's not. Uh, not just collected on the front end and sent directly to the Facebook pixel, for example, but rather <clears throat> it's like there's a back end process which takes the user database and uploads it to Facebook lookalike audiences. Um, and no cookie banner can touch that. It's like completely in a different system. Um, and so like you can't really comply with just uh, just the front end technology. Um, and so, for example, in the last year, we've seen a lot of that. Um, but a lot of customers generally will, uh, at any given point, regardless of like the sort of newest requirement or the sort of like privacy law du jour, we have, um, we always see that businesses always want to level up how they perform data mapping, um, and how they understand what systems they have in their business, what data is inside those systems, because that's usually a, a very sort of heavy manual process of interviewing people. Um, and whenever th those interviews are done, it's usually like two days before that like data map falls out of date again. Um, and so switching to something that is much more automated, real time, continuous, uh, being able to con continuously scan data stores, um, we see that as a super, super common place to start at any, at any point, regardless of where, um, regardless of the sort of like current cycle of uh privacy laws are ben you brought up a really interesting example which i mm -hmm. see all the time people think i have my facebook pixel as an example picks you know insert social media pixel and sure. then the marketing team though is also taking that data and uploading it directly to an agency site for them to do it or they're potentially you know a lot of times entering it directly into the social site can yeah. you share how the the software would flag or catch that type mm -hmm. of you know separate I'm going to call it kind of manual activity? Yeah. Um, so for every flow of data, so we would consider like um, all of those like categorically as like flows of data in the business. Um, and so if you imagine like a business has um, in the abstract like a whole lot of pipes that go out to thir like third party vendors. Um, we are sort of in the business of like installing valves on all of those pipelines, such that if a user opts out, we can shut off that the valve for that person. Um, and so in the uh, in the automated case, let's say it's a it's a script which um, you know daily runs that takes the user database, puts it into Facebook look like audiences. Transcend would sit in that script, basically filter out anybody who had um, who had opted out of sale in this case, um, and that would be um, that would be an automated process uh, for doing that. In the case that let's say it's a marketer who is doing something by hand more manually, we would find the insertion point where either it's at the place where they're downloading the list itself. This is typically where we'll sit where. We'll sit in front of that list download of like, let's take our users uh, or let's take our contact form submissions or something like that. Um, Transcend will usually run a filter on that download before they get the spreadsheet, which they then upload into Facebook look like look like audiences. Um, but there's other ways of cutting it where um, like even if they download the list elsewhere, they can then run a filter against Transcend and basically get the opt outs um, so they can cross reference it. Um, but usually we like to sort of like bury that problem deeper into into the tech um, so that they're only getting the um, the users who have not opted out. Thank you for sharing. That was really, really. Of course. Helpful.
Yeah, and 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 just like broadly, I think there's always a sort of there's a more technical way of installing these processes, whether it's uh, with something like consent or whether it's with something like your data mapping process or the way that you're running data subject requests. Um, we are kind of always searching for the like more of a steady state solution where you know if people come and go in the organization like the privacy like policies and technical controls should live on um and uh, and ultimately like it just creates massive efficiency gains for privacy teams um a lot of whom have sort of found themselves in recent years like just running a lot of ops work um rather than doing sort of like the more policy work that i think they often signed up for um and uh, and so what we ultimately want to do is like equip those folks with the ability to say like here's the th here's basically my runbook that i do like that i run every morning or every day um of operational work and like help them sort of make the decisions um and encode these workflows and, and technical controls into their tech stack so we really want to empower those people um with uh that ability without having to sort of go through engineering which is kind of the traditional status quo fair point yeah so with so many new privacy laws coming onto the scene what new jersey is our latest entrant into the private it is law signed game. sealed and delivered so mm -hmm. how do you believe companies should maintain their data privacy program in light of this dynamic regulatory environment yeah um great question so um i i i really believe that um uh, privacy challenges are primarily stemming from the complexity of the organization's data first and foremost um and that the number of laws has been a factor but not as big a factor uh in sort of some of the fundamental solves in privacy programs. Um, the exception to that, of course, is when a new when a new law envisions a new technical requirement, um, which then requires new technical approaches. Uh, that is usually like a broader project. So I mentioned sort of California's do not sell mechanism. That was kind of a creative net new opt out that uh, required new technological approaches. Um, which you wouldn't be able to sort of take your GDPR tech and just sort of like apply it. Um, and so um, I think the, the way I see it, most privacy programs are actually quite effective and most legal teams are quite effective at the law half of this, which is like, we, under, we understand the law, we're going to read it, like we're going to keep on top of it. We're tapped into our community, like maybe we're in the IPP and on newsletters and um, we're at least aware of this like pipeline of legislation. Um, and I think I think like that half of the industry is very effective and does good work. Um, I think the opera operationalization part is just fundamentally hard because um, what privacy laws have essentially asked organizations to do is like have lawyers um, become experts in like all of the actual corporate data systems. Um, and if you imagine like the two most esoteric degrees, it's like a law degree and a computer science degree. And like, they both, both parties speak completely different languages. And now they have to like collaborate on this massive, like horizontal project in the organization. Um, and, um, I think a lot of privacy professionals like really resonate with this, like this issue of like they're always sort of asking engineering for help on stuff. And like, it's just really hard to get that resourcing when like engineering is 100% um, incentivized to work on the product roadmap. Um, and so, uh, so really fundamentally, like what we believe in terms of like how companies need to maintain their data privacy program is to really like pursue that holy grail, which is like, to to have the ability to set technical controls on personal data in a self-serve way without having to go through engineering each time. Um, and so um, that actually, once you have um, 
a system which is integrated with all of the data systems in your business and has the ability to set policies and technical controls on the personal data in those systems. Um, you're then enabled to do things like implement do not sell or share uh, on your own. And you don't need to ask engineering for much more. Um, when um, a new data system comes online, like uh, you know, somebody buys a new vendor or uh, you know, adds a new database, you're aware of that. You can um, you can actually install those policies directly into those systems, um, and you can stay on top of your pr privacy program super effectively. And then when new requirements come out with new laws, you shouldn't have to again go through engineering for that. So like really sort of like removing that like development life cycle from every new law, I think is the key to like being able to efficiently maintain a privacy program. Um, and then of course, I think the, the the obvious part of this is like, make sure your program is set up to be aware of these new laws as they come out um, and like to analyze those laws, understand how they apply to you. Um, and uh, if you don't have like a, you know, if that's not like something you want to be doing, like, um, you know, Jody should, should be working with you and helping you with that. And like, uh, yeah, but like, I, I, I think, I think there's kind of like, I think the legal half is like the part that the industry well equipped for the technical and operation operationalization part. I think there's so much to be gained. Um, and so that's really where we're laser focused as transcend. Well, speaking of transitions and people trying to do things on their own, lots of organizations and even some teams are trying to figure out how do I use Gen, Gen AI, right? Generative AI all by themselves. So yeah. I'd love to get your thoughts on where generative AI is impacting and intersecting with data privacy and what should companies be thinking about? What you know, there's a rush to adopt it. What are the different risks and what are you seeing in terms of good best practices for companies yeah. trying to manage this? Yeah, it's a great question. You um, laugh. So you Justin's laughing at my question because what you think there's no companies that have good best practices. I think there's some waiting to hear our guests. <laughs> answer. I talked to one this morning. They had they had a policy and a plan for governance in place. There's a few. And ask them how a neural network works and see no, what I they didn't say and they how all... configurations for the completion works. I didn't say they all had a good plan, yes. but I think they do. <laughs> then enough of our babbling. We, I want to hear what you have to say. I think, um, what, so, so with Gen AI, like, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of companies who are sort of in, in their, like, again, sort of V0, V1 phase, which is like, um, the first, the, like first things first is like policies, like what's our internal policy. Um, we typically see folks saying like, you can't use chat GPT for work unless you're, we're on the business plan or something like that. Right. Like don't put personal data, don't put corporate data, don't put confidential documents into a consumer, um, LLM. Uh, and a lot of the time, uh, for most companies, we'll see that kind of like immediately go, uh, be, should there should be like an employee policy there because that's very commonly like the first thing that happens these tools are so utterly useful and like are so valuable to everybody's job that um the truth is companies need to find a way to give that to their employees with a vendor that will um that you know they can sign a dpa with and have data protection agreements um and so you kind of have to like first and foremost like release the pressure valve by buying a business tool that gives consumer uh, gives employees access to something like ChatGPT because people are using it regardless like eighty percent of employees are using it um, and not telling their boss um, and so um, you know that might be like go buy the ChatGPT business plan that might be go buy um, Jasper AI or something like that um, but like find a way to like really release the pressure valve so that your employees are not uploading your corporate documents and your corporate emails uh, to uh, the, the consumer grade versions. Um, now, just broadly in terms of how businesses, I, I, like how we see businesses adopting this, uh, adopting AI, like sort of internalizing it into their products, um, you know, internalizing AI into a lot of their like operational processes. Um, I think like, 
kind of the first like most obvious risk that I see is that companies are uh, really, really like aggressively trying to build embeddings off of all of their corporate data and then store them into a vector database. And this is like very kind of new bleeding edge stuff. Um, and what we see is like um, sort of a lot of companies in the hype and the like, like the urgency to do this have, you know, kind of failed to think about the data protection concerns around that. Um, so like, for example, like personal data should never be in like a, an embedding or vector database. Um, so if you have like this big data warehouse, you know, there's personal data in it, sure. Um, like taking all that data and putting it through em embeddings, putting it into a vector database so you can build like uh, a sort of custom chatbot, like that can get pretty hairy pretty quickly. And I think like in the next year, we'll probably see like our first high profile data breach, which is uh, surrounds um, a vector database being breached. Um, there's a common misconception, I think, which is that because those are sort of obscure, like if you look at like a, ve a record inside a vector database, it looks like gibberish. Um, just because it's obscure to humans doesn't mean it's uh, not, it doesn't have all that personal data. It's very easy to actually see the personal data inside those records. So like the obscurity is sort of, I think misunderstood as like a security component. Um, and so I think we're gonna see a high profile uh, that's my prediction is we'll see it within the next year, our first high profile major data breach, uh, which will be coming from uh, an embeddings data set um, inside of some some kind of vector database. Um, so I think that's kind of like one like critical thing that companies need to tamp down on now is like put the right filters on those embeddings and make sure that like you're not storing a bunch of personal data or a bunch of like sensitive data. Um, and so. Um, that's kind of like one tip I would sort of take away is like, you know, ask your data team if that's something that you're doing right now um, and make sure that there's like strong security and privacy controls there. Um, but broadly, you know, I think most most companies need to start with just like an inventory of their AI systems, much like we do with anything that's uh, related to, uh, you know, new vendors and new data systems, period. Like we need to have a basic catalog of AI models um, being used, uh, all of the sort of applications that are actually running with AI systems, and then be able to actually cross-reference that against like an assessments uh, process. So we're already doing DPIAs. We should be doing um, AI impact assessments. Um, there are great risk management frameworks out already. Um, so uh, I, I personally like the, the NIST RMF, um, but there's also OECD frameworks. Um, and starting to sort of benchmark a lot of these against the EU AI Act, which um, you know we all know is going to be uh, a much more uh, like it's going to be in law and will be in effect. Um, so it's like now is the time to start on actually assessing, inventorying all of your AI systems. Um, and then finally, I think like you know, Transcend is always thinking about like okay, great, like. We've got our inventory. We have we have a, an AI inventory product at Transcend. Great, that's like step zero. Like uh, you can log your systems. You could do uh, assessments against those AI systems. But like now that we know all of that, like how do we actually like get into the technical weeds of that and say like we don't want to put personal data in um, maybe a third party LM, right? Like how do we actually make that possible? Um, and so Transcend is building a lot of roadmap around um, uh, basically a system which can sit between a business and their LLMs and be able to run any kind of policy on the chat. Um, so if somebody is about to upload personal data into the LLM, um, Transcend can redact that data before it hits the LLM or replace it with synthetic data. And then conversely on the response, um, if the response is, let's say, toxic or leaking other people's personal data, we can again catch that, scrub it out, and uh, and prevent that from being ultimately leaked back out to maybe like a support chat widget on the website. Um, and so we're really investing in uh, R and D and roadmap around like 
really getting into like the nuts and bolts of like operationalizing AI governance. Um, but uh, it's a super exciting space. It's all obviously super early. And so if nothing else, just start with the inventory. Uh, just at least, again, just get knowledge of what AI systems you have in your business. Know your data. Your favorite phrase. That's right. I want my t-shirt. <laughs> um, so uh, when you're out and about um, at a cocktail party, what is your best personal privacy tip you'd like to share with our audience? Personal privacy? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so I think the best personal privacy tip is actually uh, it's it's to go through your phone and actually look at all the third party apps and change the settings because, uh, you know, it may have been like five years ago that you just like dismissed the location question and just said like allow access to data. There's like so many apps on most people's phones that are getting consistent location data or other sort of like fairly intimate data, which I think is no longer as acceptable to most people these days. Um, and so like it really behooves us to have like personal hygiene around what our devices are tracking and sending to third parties. Um, and it's sort of like doing privacy checkups. I, I, I think that's like half of the battle when working with um, personal devices. And I think that's ultimately like where a lot of our privacy issues kind of stem from is like just the troves of behavioral data that are being generated by like these big sensor boxes in our pockets and uh, then being sort of spew spewing out to, you know, dozens of companies. Um, so for, that's my personal uh, hygiene tip. Um, the And then sort of similarly, I think you can do that with like your Chrome browser uh, or like switch to Brave, which is what I do. Uh, I usually run a VPN. Um, but like really, it seems like a lot of it comes from the uh, the the cell phone. So that's that's where I'd start for any sort of behavioral data. That's a good tip. And when you're not building a privacy company, what do you like to do for fun? So most of my time right now is consumed by my puppy. Uh, so we just got a uh, a little multi poo named Archie. He's the sweetest little dog. Very busy. I know it sounded like you have a dog too. Um, but yeah, just like we're in that kind of like first uh six month phase where it's just like a lot of attention and uh just so much fun um but that is that is what i've been doing lately um and then just generally um uh, you know i my my hobbies are around filmmaking uh and and music and so i i, I like to sort of jam or uh make sort of uh make some videos uh and and you know whatever the opportunity is to like make a sort of short film or something I'll, I'll i'll i'm excited to do something like that i have to admit i don't think we've heard that hobby before so that one sounds really fun and interesting maybe we'll be able to find them on online if you share any of them sure yeah um uh, on my vimeo you're gonna say something different. i'm going to be having my film filmmaking of my first jody deep fake no deep fake um <laughs> So Ben, if people would like to connect with you and learn more, where should they go? Yeah. Um, so first, transcend.io is our is our website. Um, please feel free to check us out. Um, and uh, to reach out to me personally, like I, I my DMs are open on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, so just search me for me, Ben Brook, on each of the platforms. You'll you'll see me, co-founder and CEO of Transcend. Um, and happy to chat about your privacy program. You know, if anything about this resonated with you, particularly if you feel like um, a lot of your sort of privacy challenges stem from the complexity of your data, that is really our bread and butter. So uh, we're more than happy to help. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming and sharing all your insights today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time. <laughs>